bien, rebonjour à tous. Hello and welcome back for those who were not here this morning. This morning continues. We're happy to see you so numerous for this continue this plenary is slightly exceptional. We wanted to vote it to the publication of a book that perfectly embodies what Normandy pour la paix is. This book is called Between War and Peace: Story and Politics of Conflicts Around the World. It is signed by Sandeep Vaslekar. He is a researcher in international tech. He is the president of the Indian State Tech Strategy for Thai Group. Sandeep, please join us on the podium. And this book. Sandeep with us. No, but. Uh, <laughs> Sandeep, this livre is sort. Uh, this book is coming out and the opportunity of the forum is published at the CNRS edition in partnership with Normandie pour la Paix with a, a very nice introduction by Bertrand Badi. And Sandeep will be signing his book at the end of the debate at 3.30 at the e library on the village. Let's uh, move some years back. We are in June 2019 here at the Forum Normandie pour la Paix. This was the second edition back then around the Sandeep Westlika, a certain number of Nobel Peace Prizes, decided to draft together the Manifesto Normandy for Peace, a text that is calling upon the new challenges, existential challenges for humanity, and that wants to be an address for the future generation. This manifesto is now our roadmap, Normandy for Peace, and it's based on this manifesto that was born a book to start a debate and to uh, raise awareness and also think about ways of action for the population with a simple ambition, changing the situation, the aim objectives to avoid Armageddon, nothing less than that. To give you the, here are the main chapters of the book, six of them. The first uh, chapter dealt with the uh, aw absolutely aw important awareness that uh, Humanity is threatened by extinction with a nuclear risk and the eventual technological evolutions. Second chapter deals with the nation state and the nationalistic feeling that pushes to confrontations instead of cooperation. And the third one is talks about war for its author. If war is never a fatality, it's always a choice, and he will explain to us an instance. The fourth chapter is dedicated to the role that the people should play in the civil societies to not be the hostage of the decision of a few leaders in the planet that impact the entire humanity. And the fifth chapter is a reflection on the necessary refoundation of international games of play so that uh, unilateralism and multilateralism must not be an empty promise. And the last chapter is a call for the citizens in the, around the world to unite around a new social contract, worldwide social contract that goes beyond borders and differences. This book is going to be debated with a certain number of very high uh, stakeholders. All are legitimate to talk about the subjects that we have in this book, and it will be our honor, uh, the honor we also have welcome here, the ambassador of Ukraine in France, Mr. Olechenko, who will be at the end of the roundtable, will be uh, at the exceptional roundtable, and will be saying the final words. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your presence among us. Pour animer cette to animate this exceptional plenary sessions, we have asked a famous journalist. He's covered a certain number of comics. He was a correspondent for a certain number of uh, important uh, TV chains in Moscow and in Washington. He uh, uh, has received many prizes in journalism. He's Ulysse Gosset, ground reporter at BFM TV. Charlize. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you at this Forum de Normandie under this beautiful weather and this extremely intense program. I would like to call on the, the member of this panel. Among them, we have two Nobel Peace Prizes, and I would like to re-invite Sandeep, this time uh, Sandeep, the author of the book Between War and Peace. Please give him a big hand this time. Ukraine is uh, 
as the place of honor. Please, uh, Alexandra Vichuk, to please join us on the podium. Johnny Williams, who's also Nobel Peace Prize. Johnny Williams, welcome. Please join us. Stefan Lofsen, who's the former Stefan Lofsen, who's the former Prime Minister of Sweden, who is co-president of the Consultative Committee of the UN for the Multilateralism, and Fina Aja Idris Ba, who is she's the founder of the Young uh, Club of Young Women Leader of Guinea. Hello, Aja, and welcome. Voyez, c'est presque. As you see, it's almost perfect. Three women, three men. It is parity, always achieved that at the Forum of Normandy. As it's been reminded three, uh, four years ago, uh, we wrote and signed this Normandy Manifesto. But so many things happened in the past four years. Past four years, we had the pandemic, which was a global upheaval in the world. And we in Europe, we had the war in Ukraine that has completely changed the gameplay. Um, it was during the 75th anniversary of the Normandy storming of the beaches and the liberation of France. It was people that were calling upon to a, um, we are going to celebrate the 80th anniversary of the liberation. What happened in these four years? This manifesto still up to date. Has there any progress been made? This call for no, or Nobel Peace Prizes has been heard. This is one of the questions we'll have to answer. But first of all, I would like to ask Sandeep, who's the author of this book. In your book, you allude to the, to the uh, clock, Einstein's clock, that is the doomsday clock that is counting before the apocalypse, before the end of the world, how many minutes we are left. And in his book, he says, we, have hundred, we are 100 seconds away from the apocalypse. But this book was written from a couple of months ago. I would like to ask you, hello, Sadib. Um, please, how far, how far away, how many seconds are away from the apocalypse are we away if we measure it on the Einstein clock, the doomsday clock? to be in Normandy. <laughs> it's uh, one of the few regions or maybe the only region in the world which is having an active pro-peace promotion policy. And thank you, uh, President Harvey Moran, for hosting the Peace Forum every year. But the rest of the world is not as peaceful as the decision makers here in Normandy would like to believe. I first wrote the book in English called A World Without War. That was published in 2022, that is last year. At that time, the doomsday clock set up by a Nobel laureate economist, a scientist of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, had set the doomsday clock at 100 seconds to midnight. And midnight is the moment when the entire world would be destroyed. Human civilization will be over. This 12,000-year-old project of the evolution of human civilization will come to an end. That's midnight. And in 2022, the clock was set at 100 seconds to midnight. So in the book, I mention 100 seconds to midnight. But in the meanwhile, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists met again. And now they have set the clock at 90 seconds to midnight. So in last one year, we have come 10 seconds close to our collective death as a humanity. And that's very dangerous. It's the most dangerous moment in the history of our species, not only since 1947. This means we are 90 seconds uh, in three months who will be 90 seconds from the eradication of humanity and the apocalypse. Is that what you're saying? And you share this analysis? Well, right now we are 90 seconds to midnight. In three to four months from now, they will set the clock again. And my guess is they will probably go to 80 seconds to midnight. This is my guess. I don't know, but this is my guess. It could be 80. So we are every day, every hour, every second, moving close to Apocalypse. We are moving close to our collective death. I'll just give you, I'll just tell you one story. You know that COVID uh, started at the end of 19. 
And when the COVID started at the end of 19, for the next two years, we would have thought that the world leaders will give attention to tackling the problem of COVID. And maybe many of you believe that that's what happened, that from 19 to now, world leaders were giving attention to the tackling of COVID. But no, Russia tested the avant-garde missile, which travels at 27 times the speed of sound on the Christmas day of 2019. And in March of 20, in the middle of COVID, the Americans tested hypersonic missile. And a few months later, the Chinese tested hypersonic missiles. So instead of managing COVID as a priority, the world's big powers were busy in a race of hypersonic missiles, which can not be detected by, by radars, and which can carry a nuclear payload of two megatons, and which can kill the which can kill large sections of humanity and, and finish the human civilization. That is where the priority of some of our world leaders is, and that's a shame. Alors, vous parlez des missiles. So you're talking about the hypersonic uh, missiles that are developed by in Russia by Vladimir Putin. This allows us to introduce our second panelist, which is, I remember, is a Nobel Peace Prize for 2022, Alexandra Mevichuk. She is a human rights lawyer. Alexandra, uh, you who are one of the voices of Ukraine today in this forum of Germany, what is your message? We remember that uh, for years there was a call to for peace. We see that war is now again back in Europe. What is for you the most um, important element? What could, what can you tell? What do the Ukrainians feel now that the war is continuing? I am a human rights lawyer, which means that I have been applying the law to defend people and human dignity for many years. But at present, I and other Ukrainian human rights colleagues are doing our job in the circumstances when the law doesn't work. Russian troops deliberately shelling residential buildings, schools, churches, hospitals, attack evacuation corridors, manage filtration camp systems, organize forcible deportations, commit murders, tortures, rapes, abductions, and other kinds of offenses against civilians. And the entire international system of peace and security can't stop these Russian atrocities for nine years already. So I think that the main question for us as if human beings who live in 21 century is how we will be able to defend people, their lives, their freedoms, and their human dignity. Can we rely on the law and international orders or just weapons matter? And the answer to this question will define not just Ukrainian, but our common future. If we not be able to restore international order, to stop Russian war against Ukraine, and to punish Putin and top political leadership of Russian state for the crime of aggression, we will find ourselves in the future which can be dangerous to anyone without any exceptions. And believe me, when people understand that their human rights and guarantees depends not on international law, but whether or not they live in a country with a strong military potentials, it means that dozens of other countries will create nuclear weapons. Sit. Cette année, le, le thème. This year, the topic of the forum is resistance. I think resistance, Ukrainian, and the people of Ukraine is an example of this resistance. Uh, today, uh, we are going to going towards a new winter of war. How does this resistance function? What is motivating the Ukrainians? How could you describe what the Ukrainians are feeling when the war is continuing? How do they prepare to live this new third winter of war? It's not easy thing. Last December, I found myself in a flat without heating, light, electricity, water, internet connection, 
and then even mobile connection will disappear. And I told to myself, oh my God, I live like in the Middle Ages, suddenly, in the center of Europe, in the capital, where we have everything before Russia started this war of aggression. So what helped us to fight for our freedom and for our democratic choice with Russia, which is so strong, enormous, opposing power? First, we believe in people, because people who fight for their dignity and for their freedom are much more powerful even than the second army in the world. And Ukrainians convincingly proved this. And second, eyewitnesses from my own experience when large-scale invasion started and all international organizations evacuated their personnel because they think that maybe three or four days and Kyiv will be occupied by Russians. And war is horrible and very bloody, but ordinary people remained. And ordinary people started to do extraordinary things. It were ordinary people who took people out from the ruined cities. It were ordinary people who helped to survive under artillery's fire. It were ordinary people who broke encirclement to provide humanitarian aid because ordinary people have much great impact that they can even imagine. And I would never wish any nation to go through our experience because it's tough and horrible. But these dramatic times provide us an opportunity to express the best in us, to be courageous, to fight for freedom, to make a difficult but right choices, and to help each other. And this is maybe the main essential thing which I want to deliver when we help in each other, when we struggling for each other, this is something which makes us equitably aware what doesn't mean to be human beings. Because there are so many things with no limitation with national borders, and human solidarity is one of such things. Merci, Oksana. Thank you, Oksana. When we talk about the war in Ukraine, there's one marking factor, is that a big part of the territory is so covered with landmines that have been deposited by the Russians, and the struggle against landmines is the struggle of Jody Williams, who is a Nobel Prize, and he received it because of mobilization in order to get to get banned landmines, and we see that in Ukraine, landmines uh, will be there for the next generation, uh, strewn across the country, and there are other weapons that have also been used by um, um, Russia, Jody Williams, uh, how do you react um, to this assertion? Even though your struggle was recognized universally, we can see that landmines are continue continue to be used, and even more and even more deadly weapons are being used, um, anti-civilian weapons. So how do you live this, and how do you react face to this with the situation? I guess I react with anger, um, but I also echo the words of people who spoke this morning, of Alexandra right now. It is horrible that we allow our governments to pursue weapons instead of human dignity, instead of caring about health, education, etc. We allow our governments to do that. I'm from the United States, one of the most imperialist warrior countries in the world, and Americans think that it's peaceful. It makes me want to cry. My country spends 57% of our annual disposable budget on the Pentagon and weapons. Think about that, 57%. Something like 5% goes to education, 5% goes to medicine, 5% to other things here and there. But the military, the weapons prevail. 
when we do nothing to follow the money, as is said in many movies these days, follow the money and you'll find the answer. Follow the money. If I follow the money of my country, it shows that militarism and the ability to wage war is more important than the people of my country. I chose during the war in Vietnam, all us old people know about that, you young people you probably have never even heard the word. I started as an activist against the war in Vietnam, against my country's invasion of Vietnam, after France left, by the way. Um, and I have chosen to be an activist my entire life. Just as it is a choice to go to war, just as Mr. Putin chose to fill his delusions of grandeur by invading Ukraine, I took a different choice. I chose to be part of resistance. I chose to speak out against the militarism of my country time and time and time again. I chose to be a member of civil society, ordinary people. My family lived you know, on the, what do we call it, the ragged edges of the middle class. We did not have money. I did not have a silver spoon in my mouth. But I made the choice that I wanted my life to make a difference to other people. And I call on all the young people here today because you too are victims of the choices of many of the old people in the world. Climate change, which may end us, if nuclear weapons don't, are the choices of the old people of the world. France still has its nukes. Won't give them up because it says if it does, nobody will pay attention to France. Hello, is that a reason to keep a nuclear bomb? Is it? Nobody will pay attention to me if I don't have my bomb. I challenge the young people to work for a different world. Work for a world where human dignity matters. Work for a world where I don't have to like you necessarily. I don't like lots of people, I'll be honest. Nobel Peace Prize did not make me a saint. But I recognize your humanity. I recognize your right to live the way you want to live. I will not impose myself on you, you won't on me. You can make those choices. And it is easier today than when I started in Vietnam. You have the internet, you have you know, all the technology in the world. and You can find anything you need to know about whatever issue makes you hot and bothered or angry. But the only answer to righteous indignation over things in the world or anger is action. If you take action, you will not only empower yourself, you will help empower those around you to participate in being positive change in the world, which we all desperately need. I hope, thank you. Merci, uh, Jody Williams, alors. Thank you, Jody Williams. After the, uh, the uh, rule of survival, it's this uh, commitment uh, and challenge to the youth. And now I want to give the voice to youth. It's not anyone, because of the African youth. Africa, it's tomorrow's continent, with more than 1.5 billion inhabitants. Uh, that has been touched by pandemic, um, uh, climate change, and the coups uh, in Guinea. Uh, she, um, Aja Idrissa Ba, she set up a club of young women leaders of Guinea. And I think for you, the commitment number one is uh, youth commitment and for engagement for women. What does motivate you, you and the young Africans, to get 
uh, active and what message do you want to convey to the young people who are here today on this commitment of the youth which is absolutely indispensable in the context uh, thank you hello everyone this is a very good question what is pushing this youth today to to commit to get motivated and mobilized i'm sure that the majority of the people here in the room they are perfectly connected, they are informed about everything that's going on around the world and knew perfectly how far we young people are the victims. We have to, we need to live with the decisions that are taken at completely different levels by the leaders of the main, of the bigger main powers. And today, when, if I look at Africa, at Guinea, at my country, Guinea, I, I'm going to give you some examples. These young people, they are killed they are the victims of hunger. They are victims of being not enough education. There's no hospitals when you need health care. And, uh, and we are the victim of what afterwards? We try to cross the Mediterranean to, crawl, to come to Europe. And I mean, 160 or 70 of them who drown while trying to cross the Mediterranean. And that's just another part. We are victims of what we've seen during the COVID. She just said earlier there were decisions. Um, de penser à la... there, were, there were more thinking about war and rather than health. At that time, we, the young people, we were in lockdown. We had no choice. We were stressed. We didn't go to school. We didn't go to university. Who's the, who told us that it was not a, a, a plot in order to kill them so that they can organize in order to build their weapons and arm themselves? We do not trust these the main powers anymore. And this is the answer to your question. This is what brings us to get committed. We young people who face these issues and say no to all this. So it's very nice to listen, to magnify all these speeches, all these nationalistic speeches and these coups that, are, that appear to, to, to embellish and to praise the coups and say, we're going to attack other nations. But that is not the case. We, not, we, we should not push uh, the youth into lies. Do not abuse youth by telling them lies. And do not push young people against uh, other young people. Well, so we had the Liberty Prize 2023. Did France position itself and sense, since it's Guinea and since we are not necessarily agree with what is going on in Guinea, we are going to close all opportunities because we're not going to give a prize to this community use. This is the reality. It's the same just we on our side. This use young people did get said no to our leaders, try to uh, raise barriers between us and other continents and other powers because we cannot, we cannot succeed alone. We cannot uh, do it when we close at each other. And we cannot just succeed if by just listening we need to get active also. You understood. Uh, remember her name. Now you know why she is the Grand Prix Freedom 2023 of Normandy. Please give a big hand for her engagement. You mentioned um, the youth that are the victim of uh, major powers, but also of the uh, coups. You also spoke of the migrants, young people who are not because they want, because they're forced to flee they are, and risk their life trying to cross the Mediterranean or elsewhere uh, the, uh, on the channel. Uh, the debate on migration in France is extremely important. What can you tell us about the way you uh, listen or feel what the French people or the Europeans say about migration, the fears that it generates in the public opinion in, in Europe. Yes, we hear the speeches. Of course, we're not happy hearing that at one moment when um, when there's more, when there's uh, debates around uh, welcoming these migrants who flee their countries because they would have preferred staying at home if the situation had been perfect. But I need to say that the responsibilities are shared. At one moment, you need to question all these states uh, because not only our states to say when build hospitals for us, build um, schools, build trading centers, allow these young people to find jobs, 
all this would allow these young people to live and work where and find their life, uh, where they live. And if that doesn't happen, we point a finger. So on the other hand, we have our resources. We are very rich countries. We have many natural resources, many riches. Um, we have we have a. Um, Guinea is the second country for mining resources, and we do not mine these resources because it's these big Western countries that come, these rich countries that take the decisions that are taken by these major powers. And one moment, we do not want to welcome these poor people who live in Africa and who need to run away in order to have a decent life, better than what they're living, to understand the, the challenges on both sides. So at one moment, we really need to have a dialogue a 50-50 win-win dialogue between the great powers and said, no, we are going just putting the continent on the table and then we're going to slice it up among ourselves. That is the problem today. These major powers, when you look at Russia, China, France, or all the other uh, concerns, even Africa, they do not manage uh, to dialogue on a common uh, aspect. And this is the problem. Who is the victim? Who does support it? And it's because we are the ones supporting all that. We are not the future of the country. We are the present. We are the ones crossing the materials. Those who lead us, who do compromise with these states, we do not really know what's happening in the palace walls. But uh, these political decisions that are being taken by these major powers, they are influencing the future of these young people and the migration is continuous. They're not being welcomed in Italy or not being welcomed in France. They are filling our countries with their culture. We like to, would like to stay at home, but we would have preferred to stay at home and build a decent life in our countries if we had the possibility to do it. Stefan Lovgren, you are the ancien. Stefan Lovgren, you are the former Prime Minister of uh, Sweden. You are very committed in the defense of uh, efficient multilateralism. You see that uh, today the major international institutions like the UN are Pope and powerless at the UN, the veto power of veto is systematic. We kind of ask what is the power, the capacity of acting of the UN and to reform, because for years uh, the countries particularly the Afri African countries, want to have a more important seat at the table in the UN. You, what are your answer to all the people who say that we need, that these international institutions need to reform, need to adapt to today's reality? Do they still have a meaning? Uh, and for you, what is the priority today in this debate? We can see that the African youth, they're a victim of all that. What do you propose to these youth that is calling upon you? First, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm very proud to be here. I also would like to congratulate Sandeep Vaslekar for a, a very important book. It comes very timely. We should read it. It's not only an alarm bell, it is also a description of what we can do differently. Let me, let, let me start with the, with the Russian attack on Ukraine. The full-scale invasion started uh, in 2014, but then a full-scale invasion uh, later. Uh, what, what, first, what we must see now is Russia cannot win that war. This is something we need to dedicate and say, Russia cannot win this war, because if Russia wins this war, well, the, the international law, the UN Charter, the, the, all the rights are gone. So that's why Russia cannot win this war. Then, when time comes, we have to think more about a sustainable peace, and I will come to the UN, uh, UN organization, we need to shift to what we call collective security. Because the security that we build uh, today on, on uh, a never-ending increased uh, expenditure of, a, uh, sorry, increase of a military expenditure is not the sustainable security. It is not. It is very temporary. Right now, we need to help Ukraine win this war. But in the long run, we need to find something else. We must go from the nationalism and the regionalism that we see today. Everybody thinks they are the most important uh, country in the world, the most important people in the world. That's not the case. We are all important, all people uh, of the world. So we need to move to more sustainable uh, security. And that is why we need to gather under the UN flag. Now, the UN need to, uh, not only UN, but the multilateral system need to be more efficient, more effective. We're doing things 
too slow. Uh, we, do, we don't do even what we, what we want to do, although it's slow. One of those things is we need to bridge the gap between North and South. Your description is exactly as it is. You're absolutely right. So I think the global North, the richer part of the world, um, developed world or whatever we call ourselves, have a huge responsibility in taking on this. And we need to understand, and this is the point, we must understand that when we make people, uh, sorry, lives better for others in other countries and other parts of the world, we make it better for ourselves. Because when we, when we as countries, as nations, help other countries to feel more safe, we are more safe. The more insecure our neighbors are, the more insecure we are. The more secure our neighbors feel, the more secure we are ourselves. So there's a very strong incentive for nations to, to cooperate on the, the collective security. We propose, I've worked uh, with the High Level Advisor Board, co-chairing with former President of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, a High Level Advisor Board on Effective Multilateralism. And we propose, uh, among other things, uh, we need to change the, uh, the representation in the Security Council. It needs to be more uh, a, a more equity representation, meaning that a large part of the world today is not represented uh, as, a re as a permanent member in the Security Council. We also may need to make sure that the Security Council actually can act. And if it can't act, it couldn't act when it came to, to Russia and uh, Russia's aggression, aggression on Ukraine. So Russia starts a war and then sits in the Security Council and says, no, we do everything that the Security Council wants to do. So we are proposing that one example is not the solution, but one example is to, okay, bypass the Security Council, send it directly to the General Assembly and see what can be done. The General Assembly, UN can cooperate in a more effective way also with the regional organizations. Can I just say one thing at the very, very end? We need to go push for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Yes. We propose um, that we have an end date of the nuclear weapons in 2045. In that case, we've had nuclear weapons uh, on the earth uh, for 100 years, century. Now, these nuclear weapons are there to, you know, the concept is called, and this is important, the concept is called mutually assured destruction. So today's security is that we can destroy one another. And to me, that is not really security. That is not security. We need to move to mutually assured survival. And a part of that is to get rid of the nuclear weapons because as has been said earlier, that is a threat. Every breath we take, we rightly so discuss climate and what we need to do for climate that is absolutely perfect. We need to continue that. But this is a threat that is here and now. Every second, every breath we take, every hour we live, it's a threat. And we can't accept that. So from mutually assured destruction to mutually assured survival would be a good path. Thanks. Merci. Je vais donner la parole à Sundeep, mais Oksana, vous voulez réagir tout de suite. Allez. Um, Oksana, you wanted to react before I give the microphone to Sundeep? I just wanted to tell one important thing, because we are in a peace forum, and I would want to bring the human dimension, what peace does it mean? Because in a sharp political discussion, sometimes we, we hear that Ukraine has stopped resistance and satisfy Russian imperialist appetites just to achieve so-called peace. But it's a huge lie. Country which was invaded, when such countries stop fighting, it will be not a peace, it will be occupation. And I work directly with people affected by this war. Let me tell you what does that mean Russian occupation is about. Russian occupation is enforced disappearances, sexual violence, torture, denial of identity, forcible deportation of Ukrainian children to Russians, 
ethnical cleansing, mass graves, filtration camps. This is Russian occupation. It's not a peace at all. And that is why we have no moral rights to leave our people alone for torture and death under Russian occupation. Because we want peace. And peace is not something which we can take for granted when country invaded to our country. This means that we have to fight for sustainable peace. Just a chance for our people to live without fear of violence and to have a long-term perspective. I think this is very important to define this term, what peace does it mean. Dans votre livre, in your book, Sandeep, you say that humanity is faced with an existential threat. And you say that the first necessity is to be aware, the generations need to be aware. Here we see that the youth, the people, the youth, of course, first around the world, they are aware about the global climate change and they will be able to grow old in a world that is burning that is uh, faced with natural catastrophes, with uh, flooding, with fires uh, caused by climate change. There is an awareness on climate, but is there also a awareness on a nuclear threat? We just uh, record that there's a necessity to do a moratorium on, uh, on nuclear energy, uh, on the nuclear weapons. How can you tell the youth people that a moratorium on nuclear power is indispensable? How what can motivate young people to say that we can realistically uh, envision a moratorium on nuclear weapons? That seems very far uh, when we see a Russia, a Russia a regularly threatened uh, Europe and the rest of the world with nuclear weapons. All existential threats to humanity are important. Climate crises are like cancer. We will die in 200 years or 300 years, a torturous death, slowly suffering from the deterioration of the ecology. Pandemic, if another pandemic happens, a big one than COVID-19, it's like paralysis. You will suddenly find the human civilization paralyzed. But a global nuclear war is like heart failure. It's a heart attack. It will happen suddenly before you know it, and the entire human civilization will come to an end. So we have to recognize the importance of all existential crisis, but at the same time, we must understand the most invisible crisis, which is the likelihood of a global nuclear war, is the most dangerous. So, but there is some reason for hope, and your question is how do you mobilize in uh, favor of denuclearization, nuclear abolition, uh, sustainable peace? There are 193 countries in the world as per the United Nations membership. Out of these 193 countries, 22 countries have given up arms completely. 22 countries do not have army, they do not have military, they do not have defense minister, they do not have uh, armament at all. So 22 countries, more than 10% of the membership of the United Nations has already decided not to have arms. Donnez-nous, donnez-nous, s'il vous plaît, quelques noms de pays qui ont abandonné. Can you give us the names of some of these countries? Sorry. Ils ont abandonné la. Countries that have uh, given up uh, their defense budget, just so, so the audience knows who we're talking about. Can you give us some names of these 22 countries that have given up their their, their armies? Je vous well, pose la question parce que are... uh, on a plutôt les faits. Uh, at the moment, we're kind of seeing the. In Europe, we're seeing that the military budgets are climbing around the world um, for traditional weapons, but also for nuclear weapons. That's why I'm asking this question. Can you give us some examples? Countries have given up. Have given up weapons completely. Some of them are like Costa Rica, Panama. Just to give, and Panama is an important country. It has got Panama Canal, through which 40% of the trade between America and Asia travels. But still, Panama doesn't have weapons. Panama doesn't have army at all. 
Uh, Costa Rica is next door. You have several countries in the Pacific Oceans. We are facing many threats, and they have given up weapons. Uh, in Europe, uh, Andorra doesn't have any weapons. And Switzerland has not given up. It has an RP, but it's at a very minuscule level. So there are countries around the world. But my next point is, while 22 countries have given up all weapons, including conventional weapons, 122 countries voted in the United Nations in 2017 to prohibit nuclear weapons. 122 countries out of 193 countries. And 170 countries out of 193 countries have a military expenditure of less than $1 billion per year. So it's mostly for defense and internal security. So it's only 25 to 30 countries which are responsible for arms race, for some nine of them have nuclear weapons today, and another nine or 10 countries want to have nuclear weapons tomorrow. And they are the ones who are spending $2,000 billion a year on armament. So there are 8 billion people on the earth, but it's the leaders of only 20 to 25 countries who are holding the entire planet for ransom, the entire population of the 8 billion people for ransom. And this we don't realize. So we don't realize that these, these, these uh, leaders of 20, 25 countries are, uh, uh, can cause a war and can, uh, uh, can lead to a global war, war with nuclear weapons, not only nuclear, but also biological weapons, uh, chemical weapons, lethal autonomous weapons. Lethal autonomous weapons are the weapons which are run with artificial intelligence, and they act on their own. They are not run by military commanders. They are run by algorithms. Many of you may be in the computer science or aspiring to be software engineers. And you know that artificial intelligence can be used for good, but there is artificial intelligence being used for bad, for destruction. They are called killer robots. And Jody, in fact, has done a lot of work on uh, banning killer robots. So 20, we have to be aware of the two sides of the story. One side is that 2025 leaders ready to destroy the world. The other side of the story is that majority of the countries love peace. Majority of the countries want to live in harmony. And majority of the humanity wants no war. They want a world without war. Merci, Jody. Ça vient d'être évoqué. Thank you. Jody, we just heard that it's something new, something completely different today. That's uh, the arrival of uh, AI on the global scale in many different areas, in education, in health, but also, yes, in the world of arms. We just heard about killing robots. How do you see this uh, new rise of AI? Is it something which uh, makes you even more determined in your fight? It makes me angry. <laughs> ah. It makes my righteous indignation burn. Um, I'm too old to stop being an activist. What would I do with myself? But I learned about the attempts to marry intellig artificial intelligence with weapons and make them autonomous, which is, to me, the most disgusting. An <laughs> autonomous killer robot on its own can decide to target and kill you, or you, or you, or you, or you, or you. What human beings, what are they thinking when they decide to give that power to a machine? The laws of war, the laws and legal systems in general are human made for humans. How do you decide that it is okay to change that and let weapons of war make the decision who they're going to kill? I was writing an article for the CIA, a CIA journal actually, and that is when I learned about killer robots. And I started getting frantic. And 
spoke with my husband. I, we got married over landmines. And um, we decided to call together NGOs, non-governmental organizations, civil society, civil society, to create an effort to stop killer robots. Uh, the, another problem of the UN is consensus. Um, killer robots are debated in one section of the UN and any one country can stop progress. Like you could be in a room of 75 countries, all 74 want to ban killer robots. One country can say no, there is not consensus, therefore there will be killer robots. And I'm sorry to say that several years ago there was a training in the US and the Ukrainian Minister of Defense or whatever his title was, I cannot remember, uh, was extolling the virtues of those weapons, was pointing out, that this is you know with Crimea and the eastern part of the country, it was, uh, uh, training ground for new weapons and new methods of war. I don't care who you are. That is morally reprehensible. And I'll never stop fighting killer robots or landmines or cluster bombs or Governments who think they can do whatever the hell they want, no matter what it happens to you, or you, or you, or me, or you. I have every right to stand up and fight, and I always will, and I hope you do too. Je reviens au manifeste de 2019. I'm looking back at the 2019 manifesto that says we should ensure that war is no longer uh, a potential future and gradually give up on war. We focus on poverty, climate change, disease. I'm turning to Adja Idris Abba. You represent youth here and African youth. Do you think that this manifesto is something that you believe in? when you see that actually since 2019, war has become an even more plausible future uh, than it was back then. And the shadow of war is growing. And in Africa, you've had wars for several decades. And now you have uh, coup d'etats as well. Does this manifesto make sense to you? Do you think it's still relevant? Yes, this manifesto, I think it's still relevant. Because uh, in the past we've had war a little bit everywhere. But the question I'm asking myself is, was young people involved in this manifesto, drawing up this manifesto? No, it was a manifesto drawn up by Nobel Peace Prize winners, so people a little bit older than you. Okay, well. In terms of the fight against war, arms and the fights against climate change, I would say that I think that young people need to take control of their own futures now. They need to have power. So if we need to go to the UN and ensure that there is a representation on the Security Council and that if there are countries that want to wage war. We need to stop them in order to change their minds. And we have power. We can change people's minds, do advocacy work, because there's many of us in many different countries. But we need to do something. So if our states, if our countries want to weaponize, we should be able to say stop. So if there are places where we want young people to be represented, we need to be allowed representation and vote, stop things that we don't believe in. So in this document, I would like to ensure that young people's voice is involved to see what maybe young people can add to the text, thanks to our daily commitment. To ensure that uh, we're involved 
not just at the festive moments, but also when you're writing documents like this and that we're represented on key committees and uh, to ensure that our future is respected. In certain countries in Africa, represent, uh, youth represent 60 to 70 percent of the population. So at the Normandy Peace Forum, the next time we write a manifesto, it would be the manifesto for youth. Thank you very much for your words. In the book that you wrote, there's a very important moment where you say that war is uh, not a fate that we must accept, it's a choice. Stefan, could you tell me, could you explain to the public why war is a choice and not something that is unavoidable? And then we see that war continues uh, decade after decade. Well, first, wars just don't happen. They're there for a reason, and there could be many different reasons. The, the, the full-scale invasion and attack on Ukraine is because uh, Vladimir Putin decided to make Russia the greatest country on, on, on Earth. Uh, he would like to be uh, a new Peter. <laughs> and uh, and denazifying uh, Ukraine, I mean, which is a, a crazy reason. So, so, so there are reasons for, and it, therefore it is a choice, and it, it is exactly why we need to work more with preventing wars, preventing to stumbling into situations where we uh, have a, a conflict and then a military conflict. I'm also sharing CIPRIT, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, and the vision is to for this institute to to find out, uh, to see conflicts as possible, as, as, as early as possible, and to understand the underlying factors of the conflict so that you can work with them so that they do not uh, develop into a conflict. Well, if you have a dictator that wants to grab another country, that's, that's, another, uh, that's another case. But I, I think that we can uh, mobilize people around this collective security that we can do so much together. We we have to work with the climate transition. We have to make sure that the ne next pandemic or another disease that will occur on this on the surface of the earth that we can deal with it much better than than we did. The pollution, the biodiversity. We have so many. Uh, issues that we need to cooperate on, uh, and when we do that, we build uh, common security. We have, as I said also, a fantastic potential, the African continent, because that is a continent that will grow substantially this century and will become in population almost as big as Asia. So if we invest instead, if we understand investing, and, that, and this doesn't, uh, I mean, change the dictator's mentality all of a sudden, but mobilizing the people does. So the people see this is a much, much smarter path to take. And I would like to echo what has been said already. Youth, young people, please, you're active in climate and that is so, so good. Become more active also in fighting uh, nuclear weapons and, and war. We want you, we won't leave you alone. We will be there, we support you, but you have so many more years ahead of you than I have, and we want the best for you. So please uh, get as angry as, <laughs> as our friend here and, and mobilize. Thank you. Sandeep, dans votre livre, vous dites aussi que le Sandeep, in your book, you say that the model of nation states creates a system of confrontation. And across the world, we are seeing a rise of nationalisms and the triumph of populism in several countries, in uh, Trump's America to um, Putin's Russia. So to counter this rise of nationalisms and to prevent war, the role of civil society is very important. You're an Indian person, and we can see that Hindu nationalism is also progressing in India, leading to a lot of questions. How can civil society commit and fight against populism and nationalisms? What's your vision on uh, this situation? Albert Einstein called 
nationalism missiles of mankind. Now, because those days, 100 years ago, Einstein was, uh, when Einstein was around, missiles were the most, was the most dangerous disease which was spreading. If Einstein were alive today, he would probably call nationalism coronavirus of mankind, the way it is spreading everywhere. So nationalism can be a force for good by mobilizing different sections of society for a good cause. But nationalism can also be very destructive. Nationalism, which is against other nations, is against the very basic human nature. In India, we have rise of nationalism recently. But in India, over the centuries, there has been a philosophy which is very popular. And in, in the local language, we call it Vasudeva Kutumbakam, which means the world is one family. In Africa, especially in southern Africa, there is a philosophy called Ubuntu. Ubuntu means I am because we are. In Japan, there is a similar uh, philosophy called Chikyu Minzo Kushugi, means the world is one nation. So young people, older people, we all have to realize that nationalism is something tantalizing. It's there in front of you. And it may attract you. It may try to devour you. It may try to, to eat you up. But if you want to be sustained, then you have to follow the philosophy of Ubuntu or Vasudeva Kutumbakam. That is believe in the universalism. And that is why in my book, I have proposed a global social, new global social contract. Rousseau, when he wrote social contract, it was in 1762. And social contract of Rousseau, as many of you would be familiar, he was a half French, half Swiss man. Social contract of Rousseau said that there should be a relationship between the individual and the state, or between the society and the state. But during Rousseau's time, the confines of the state were like a city or a nation. But over the last 300 years, since 1762, uh, the world has got integrated. And so now social contract, which is limited to our nations, is not enough. We need a global social contract whereby we, are, we have a relationship between the individual and the state and the world, or between society and the state and the humanity. So we need a, we need a philosophy of dual loyalty. We should be loyal to our country, we should be loyal to our nation, but at the same time, we should be loyal to humanity. If humanity doesn't exist, what are you going to do with your country? Are you going to fly the flag of your country in the middle of a graveyard that the earth will become? Is that, is that what our objective is, to fly flags? All these wars, I mean, now there is nationalism. Earlier, there was religion. And before that, there were just kingdoms. And all these wars have been taking place in the name of either a book or a flag. The book is a religious book until 17th, 18th century, or a flag is a flag that we all have. And except for Nepal, interestingly, all flags are rectangular. So we are just fi fighting for the honor of that flag. And we are not, or we were fighting for the honor of a book. But we are not fighting for the safety of human spirit, for the honor of human spirit. We have to start thinking in terms of human spirit. And the biggest challenge in the world is how to revive human spirit. And I'll just tell one small story. There was a little boy about seven, eight years old. And an older man told him that I want to ask you a puzzle. And he gave a picture of a man, tore it off in the pieces. And behind that, there was a picture of the world, the whole world a word map. And then he told the boy that you put together this word map. And the eight-year-old boy put together the word map in five minutes. And the, uh, bigger, the older man said, even I don't know where is Ukraine and where is uh, uh, Guinea and where is uh, uh, Indonesia. How did you manage to, manage to put together the whole word in, 
in, in, in five minutes. And the little boy said, as you told me, behind the picture of the word, there was a picture of the man. I put together the man, and the word was together again. And that's what we need to do. We need to put together the human spirit. We need to put together the man with the help of the new global social contract. Merci, Sundeep. Si vous voulez en savoir plus sur le compte. Thank you, Sundeep. If you'd like to know more about this new social contract, this global social contract, then you can hear about it in this book. To conclude now, because we're getting to the end of this debate, I would like to pass over, therefore, to Judy, Alexandra, and to you. What have you heard during this debate? How would you like to conclude this debate as a Ukrainian person facing the situation of war, a situation of conflict? Everybody here defends an idea of a world without war. What would you like to say? I think that we all too long take peace and democracy for granted. And now we have ambitious task to start a cardinal reform of international system of peace and security. Because it's not working. We have to create such a system which can defend people from the wars and from the authoritarianism in different countries of the world. And this is something in which we rely on the youth which also uh, present in this audience. And as Ukrainian, I also will add that we need Ukrainian victory. When I spoke with my human rights colleague from countries of Africa, Latin America, from Syria, from Afghanistan, we all face with so much failures. We need success. Success of Ukraine will provide a chance for democratic future of Russia itself and will have a huge impact to the whole world where in some countries the size of freedom is shrinking to the size of a prison cell. Merci, Oksana. Je rappelle que vous êtes avocate. En... Thank you very much, Alexandra. You're a, a, a lawyer in Ukraine, and you've been looking at uh, war crimes since 2014. Jody, your conclusion, please. I again ask the young people to make a difference in this world. And that means making the world a better place for everyone in it, even people you do not like. Because if you make it good for your friends or a small group, that's a political party. We have enough of them making a mess of the world. Please care about the other person. You don't have to invite them home for dinner. Just care for their humanity so they will care for yours. Thank you. Merci, Jody Williams. Inno Thank you, Jody Williams, Nobel Peace Prize winner. Now, the final word for you, Aja, the voice of youth. Thank you. I'm honored to be able to say uh, the final word. I'd like to say that the, a world without war is possible, and the role of youth is essential in this piece. And we young people, we are ready. We have the tools we need to go all the way with this fight, but give us a role, trust us, call upon us, and ensure that we can speak up and give us the tools we need to be able to take action ourselves as well. Merci donc pour ce message d'espoir. Thank you for this message of hope. Thank you very much for all being involved in this debate. Now, the Ukrainian ambassador to France will be speaking Thank you very much.
Mesdames et Messieurs, chers étudiants, Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, dear friends, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today and to listen to your very interesting discussions. Monsieur Sandé, Sandip, vous avez dit Sandip, you said that we are just a few seconds away from the apocalypse. My country, the Ukrainian people, are already living through the apocalypse. The question is whether this apocalypse is reversible or not. Will we be able to bring back peace or not? It's a very difficult, complicated question to try to answer. Should we um, put aside our weapons? Would the, would the dictators be willing to disarm? No, they will not, because our people, our people have been working hard. We have been developing our country. The Ukrainian students, for example, they've all uh, been fighting for a peaceful life. They only ever wanted peace, but then the attack arrived. The savages arrive, destroying our homes, destroying our cities, destroying uh, universities and schools that have been there for many years. Many um, educational sites have been destroyed. And now Ukrainian youth is on the front line, holding back the enemy. They're resisting. There are 40,000 girls on the front line. Pardonnez-moi. Excuse me. L'Ukraine est la première à souhaiter. Ukraine was the first stakeholder to try and establish peace, to bring back peace. Cette discussion. I have heard the debates, and it was very difficult. It's certain that for the long term, we need to bring back peace. But what will be the terms of this peace? I've heard different formulas for peace. There is the Chinese option, the African option. But for us, the best option for peace is the option put forward by our President Vladimir Zelensky. Let me read the 10 points of his peace proposal. First point, radioactive and nuclear security. Secondly, food security. Thirdly, energy security. Four, the freedom of for all prisoners and all of those that have been deported. According to UNESCO's figures, not the UN's figures, sorry, 19,000 Ukrainian children that have been deported. Fifthly, the implementation of the UN Charter and the reestablishment of the uh, of Ukraine's borders and of the global order. Sixthly, withdrawal of the Russian troops and end of hostilities. Seventhly, re-establishing justice, because at the moment, with French experts, we've highlighted that there have been 80,000 cases of war crimes in Ukraine, 80,000. Should we forgive this? Should we forget about these crimes? Eighthly, Prevention. investigating genocide. Ninthly, preventing escalation of war 
and a return to of facilities temporarily, uh, defining the end of the war. Let me repeat. Ukraine is the first stakeholder that would like and is looking for peace. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. The public here and everybody here supports the Ukrainian people in your resistance. And this year we chose the topic of resistance for the forum because uh, of the situation and the, people, the resistance of the Ukrainian people has really surprised the entire world. But we need to continue with our firm support to your people. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. The forum will continue now. The village for Piv, we have photographic uh, exhibitions. They're going to be the signing of the uh, book on War and Peace. And tomorrow morning, we'll be back here for another plenary session. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you to all of the speakers, and thank you to Ulysse Gosset for the facilitation of this debate.